Good morning and, and welcome to uh, our Nuclear Communities Forum 2022. Uh, I hope all the technical glitches have been taken care of and we're all zooming from our respective desks or computers somewhere. Uh, really grateful that you've all decided to join us today. Um, our, you know, the second word in the title of this is all about community. That's the real focus today. You're going to hear from practitioners, um, both in the US as well as, as overseas, who've been working this issue for years, if not decades. Um, our goal here is to create a safe and supportive and constructive environment for people to share uh, observations, lessons, um, experiences from the field. You're going to hear from a wide variety of speakers today. but. At, at the end of the day, you know, the, the operative word here is, is uh, the operative theme is that once a plant closes, everybody more or less wants the same thing. And we're just trying to figure out the best way to make that happen with an emphasis on host communities and socioeconomic revitalization. Um, with that very short introduction, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jerry Mincer, who will walk through some logistics today, and then we'll get back to the the meat of the presentation in the forum. Again, thanks for showing up and have a good day. Thanks very much, Jim. My name is Jerry Mincer. I'm with Smart Growth America. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing examples of actionable strategies that have helped nuclear host communities across the country. Uh, as you can see, we have a very full agenda, but want to take a moment to note that our program would not be possible um, without a grant from the U.S. Economic Development Administration, and we really appreciate their support of this critical issue. We have a fantastic list of speakers and appreciate them taking the time to share their work with this audience. Um, we hope to keep these conversations going throughout the coming weeks and months, um, and you can get in touch with the technical assistance team at smartgrowthamerica.org slash nuclear. We have a great team of four nonprofit organizations um, that have worked hard to put this uh, event together, but also are really excited to work with the many communities that are hard at work every day on this issue. Um, as we get started, just a few items to keep in mind. This forum is being recorded with the exception of the discussion rooms and the networking session at the end of the day. We'll provide a recording of the main session sometime next week. If you have specific questions for our panelists, please place them in the chat box, excuse me, in the question and answer box, and we'll address as many as we have time for. You can use the chat box though to share any thoughts, ideas, resources throughout the event, but direct all of your specific questions to the Q&A box. And finally, viewers of this event are, are eligible to receive credits from the American Planning Association and to log your AICP credits, um, log into your, uh, APA account and search for the name of today's event, Nuclear Communities Forum, and we'll, we'll drop a link uh, in the chat for that. So with that, thank you again for joining. I'm going to hand things back to Jim to introduce our keynote speakers. Myself. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so look, I, I started the collaborative about five years ago to address the 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 needs of, of host communities who are trying to manage socioeconomic impacts from closure. And I really built that, that nonprofit on the shoulders of our two keynote speakers. Um, Marge Kilkelly got the ball rolling back in the 90s. She was chair of the Maine Yankee Community Advisory Panel, uh, led that community and the plant through the closure and decommissioning of Maine Yankee. Then she took that experience to Washington, D.C., where she worked with Senator King to raise national awareness on this issue. I mean, she really got the ball started uh, around economic development and the federal government paying attention to this issue. Um, so thank you, Marge, for being here today. Um, in, in parallel, in, in 97, John Mullen wrote the seminal paper, The Closure of the Yankee Row Nuclear Power Plant, The Impact on New England Community when he was a professor of urban planning at UMass Amherst. And it was the first time anybody really taken a hard, serious look at the socioeconomic dimensions of nuclear power plant closure. And his teaching and research since then has been, you know, amazingly influential in defining this field. And you will also hear from one of his former students later today. So thank you, John, for being here. 
Um, and so when, when both of my, you know, personal heroes agreed to participate today, I was, I was, I was overjoyed. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marge and then to John to sort of share their experiences over the past 20 or 30 years in this sandbox. Um, and again, thank you for being here and we look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Jim. Um, good morning from Maine. Um, about seven miles as the crow flies from the Maine Yankee ISFISI, the independent spent fuel storage installation. I had to start my talk that way because it took a long time to be able to casually say ISFISI, and I haven't had much of a chance to use it of late. So thank you for that. I'm also delighted to be with you this morning because my background's in community economic development. And this meeting and future meetings of impact to communities, I believe will provide all of you with the connections and tools that you need to assist your communities. I lived for over 20 years in Wiscasset, home to Maine Yankee, Maine's only nuclear power plant. I represented the town in both the House and Senate and as a selectman. Maine Yankee was an economic boom to Wiscasset, Lincoln County and the surrounding communities both as a financial resource, but also a magnet for young workers to move to Maine. The jobs paid well, workers brought their families. So the communities benefited from an additional influx of school students, workers and professionals who had spouses employed at the plant. During shutdown and refueling time, small local businesses saw a huge influx of temporary workers looking for housing and food. In a seasonal community, that's a significant impact but not all was rosy. Maine is a citizen initiation state where a petition can result in a statewide referendum vote on about any topic. Petition gatherers collected enough signatures for statewide votes to close Maine Yankee three times. Referendums, like any election process, are long, exhausting, expensive, and no one really comes out unscathed. In 1997, it was determined that Maine Yankee required significant upgrades and the decision was met, made to decommission the plant. The owners also decided it was critical to improve the relationship within the state and conversations about the cap began. The charter of the cap states it was designed to enhance open communication, public involvement and education on Maine Yankee's decommissioning and to function as an advisory panel. When Maine Yankee staff asked me to chair the commission, my key concern was the company's level of commitment. Would they share information in a timely manner? Would the CAP members be providing advice, not just reviewing decisions that had already been made? If Maine Yankee was asking community members to spend several years serving on the CAP, it needed to make a commitment to provide them with an honest process and information. The risks of involving stakeholders intensively in a large project like a plant decommissioning are real. However, from my main Yankee cap experience, I can say that the risks are far outweighed by the benefits. There is a role for non-technical people in technical decision-making and it should not be underestimated. It's not easy, it's not straight-line decision-making, requires a significant amount of education, commitment, and listening. Not everyone is gonna agree on a particular policy, but the community and individual input can often lead to epiphany moments that otherwise would never be found. Also, when people know that their voices are heard, even if they disagree with the outcome, conflict is diminished, trust is established, and sometimes even consensus can be found. The company took several steps early on to fulfill their commitment to the CAP. Maine Yankee made public at CAP meetings initially important information, such as the post shutdown decommissioning activities report and the selection of a decommissioning operations contractor. They gave the individual CAP members access to previously internal documents. The CAP process was transparent with minimal distance or filter between the decision makers and the general public. Transparency is essential. Transparency leads to trust. In our final report, a local newspaper comment, the CAP meetings had become Maine Yankee's report card on decommissioning. The role of the CAP in providing additional non-technical review of proposals was important as well. 
In addition to regulatory scrutiny, the decommission plans routinely were put through the public straight face test where the perceptions and perspectives of stakeholders were considered and sometimes plans were altered as a result. I just wanna to touch on a few aspects of the cabinet's work that led to our success. Diverse membership willing to sign on for the long haul. The cap was diverse from nuclear engineer, radiologists, town planners, business owners, and politicians like me who knew about nuclear power from a high school textbook. The cap included nuclear opponents, the same folks who circulated petitions to shut the plant down now served on the cap. Members knew this was gonna be a long process and challenging to understand both the technical and the regulatory aspects. So long-term commitment was key. We took time to learn. Our first year was spent on tutorials to help us be in a similar place when we moved forward. I know that was arduous for our more nuclear literate members, but they understood the importance of that process. As it turned out, we discovered that there was learning to be done on both sides. At one early session, a plant engineer concluded his remarks complete with colorful detailed slides by asking if there were any questions. As no one asked one, I took my leadership role seriously and asked a question. It was clear from the look on his face that I had not understood anything he had said likely from the first slide. That was a lesson for both of us. The plant staff who were immersed in the information and jargon every day found that they needed to translate their presentations into language that folks like me could understand. And I knew that my primary job and that of the CAP was to ask those dumb questions. I've wondered for years how much different the relationship between the state and Maine Yankee might have been if a cap like body had existed sooner. How often did the public just not understand what was being said and assume that much was being hidden? We also involved regulators in our meetings. Regularly hearing from the state and federal regulators gave us an independent review of milestones and any concerns that they might have. I also believe that sitting through some of our meetings increased their knowledge on the, of on the ground issues facing plants and communities. We had an annual meeting and agenda development. The process of decommissioning is daunting and the milestones are critical. Each year we met to discuss what we had accomplished and develop a timeline for the upcoming year to make certain that we were including necessary information for CAP members well in advance of a discussion around a report or deadline. We worked hard to be responsive and build trust. The CAP needed to hear from the public as well as the plant. Given the tensions in history, it would have been easy to have an entire public comment fill up the meeting, but that would not allow us to get our work done. So we had a standing item on the agenda for public comment, and it was always the final item. This allowed us to gather questions and information from the public and address them in future meetings or on the website where we had a Q&A section. All questions were answered. And I wanna repeat that, all questions were answered. But what about a question that couldn't wait? Such was the case of cooling fans. As decommissioning began, the storage pool cooling needed to change. Engineers developed a fan system that would cool the pool. The fans were large, they ran 24 hours a day. They did their job of cooling the pool, but the sound over the Sheepskit River meant that residents on the formerly quiet rural island of Westport found themselves living in what seemed to be the wrong end of an airport runway. One resident called the plant to inquire how long would the fans be running? And the response was, only five years. Phone calls to CAP members ensued and there was a special meeting. A couple of young parents spoke about fan noise at their homes and the impact on themselves and their children. The main Yankee president then asked to address the CAP and it was a very short address. We will take care of this. And within weeks, there are modifications to the fans that resolved the issue in a way that was satisfactory to everyone. I believe that was a significant turning point in the community's understanding of the role of the CAP, but it also built community trust in Maine Yankee leadership that they would listen and respond to community concerns. Public access was also critical. The CAP experience is about bringing community to the table and communication is key. For us in the dark ages, it was local papers, but now with Zoom, it can be in real time. 
And remember, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. At the federal level in 2013, I needed to step down from the cap because I had accepted a position in DC working with Senator King as a senior policy advisor. And of course, nuclear waste was in my portfolio. I was encouraged we'd be moving forward, especially after the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, a subcommittee of which had come to Wiscasset at the invitation of the CAP to listen to community leaders and stakeholders. They did listen to our concerns and they included the concept of consent-based citing in their report to the Secretary of Energy. At one meeting in DC, I asked a question about how do we get this moving forward? The response was perfect and framed my efforts going forward. A panelist responded, this is not a national issue, but a regional issue. And it's so true. While some states are horrified to be hosting an ISTASI, other states are interested in the material as economic development. Meetings like this are key to knowing more about the needs, the challenges, and the opportunities around the country. And this information will add robustness to your plans. It bridges the gaps and will help us move towards a real national strategy that serves everyone, but in markedly different ways. In 2018, I had the honor of working with Senator Duckworth's staff on the Stranded Act to provide financial assistance communities. The bill has been reintroduced in this, in this session and includes some important additions, such as the Stranded Nuclear Waste Task Force, as well as an annual report on high-level waste storage sites around the country. I believe that having a task force and annual report not only keeps this in front of lawmakers, but that really is the fuel for action in DC. The fact of the matter is both sides win when we talk, whether it's about storage and economic impact of plant closures or the opportunities that some places see in the reuse of waste material. You are the folks with boots on the ground who know what's going on in your community. You are the laboratories of economic redevelopment. You know what works, you know what hasn't worked. You are invaluable assets, not only to your communities, but to each other and the country as a whole, but there's more. Today, we're talking about nuclear plants, but it's also critical to remember that this is not the only disruptive force facing communities. I live in Maine where paper mill closures, military base closures and fish and fishing processing shutdowns have devastated communities. In each case, there's a group of folks who are ready to rebrand, re re rebuild and move forward. Their challenges may be different from yours, but the process is very similar. And I believe it's critical to reach out to those groups as well. I wanna end this on the flip side of where I began. Closing a nuclear power plant impacts the very fabric of your community. The upheaval is not just economic, but stresses the very threads that keep your community strong. As Maine Yankee began the decommissioning, not only were fewer staff needed, but many were leaving to seek more stable employment. The statistics folks will talk about this in the labor jargon of how many jobs were lost or how many workers were laid off, and that's the tip of the iceberg. While it may be easier to count jobs and workers, it's critical to remember that each of those jobs and workers usually represents a family, a spouse who may be employed in the community, kids in the school, people who volunteer in local programs or church and civic groups. You or your family's best friends are now moving across the country, a house that's up for sale along with many others driving down the value. Small businesses need to regroup and resize their workforce to adjust to lower sales volume. Municipal services are limited by the new fiscal reality. The shared grief of those losses is a burden on the community that's not readily talked about. But like the proverbial elephant in the room, you will either need to discuss it and get it on its way or constantly walk around it to make process. Like progress, like any form of grief, it demands attention. I urge all of you working in your communities to not overlook this in your work plans. I've hit on a few of the significant characteristics that I believe continue to make the Maine Yankee CAP successful. I believe that you all have a link to our CAP report, um, which covers it much more thoroughly. It would take all day to go through everything, but if anyone wants to contact me, I'm happy to provide more information on my experience. Thank you for what you're doing. It's hard, but important work. And thank you again for letting me practice saying is busy. Thanks.
we're we're transitioning. Hello. Hi, John. We can hear you. Okay, we're all set. Yes. Well, I'll begin. <clears throat> thanks, Jim, and thanks to the Nuclear Decommissioning Collaborator for, for inviting me. I also want to thank EDA. I'm a fan of EDA and have been funded and working with EDA for, for more than 30 years. And it's been an absolutely special agency to work. Uh, my comments today, I, I remember many, many years ago as a young altar boy uh, watching Monsignor Callahan finishing his sermon preparation before the 6.30 a.m. Uh, weekday mill workers mass. And he turned to me and he says, you know, Mullen, if you can't make your point in 10 minutes, then you can't make it. Um, I'm going to remember that today. It was also at this time that I discovered my interest in, in, in things nuclear. It was the time of the launching of the submarine Nautilus and the completion of the first uh, nuclear uh, freighter, the USS Savannah, um, and, on, and which were quickly made into models, which I made. I had them for the longest of time. Um, I also collected stamps. And I remember the Adams for Peace stamps, my dad, as a condition for giving me the four cents or three cents to buy the stamp said, yeah, I had to study what the meaning of the stamp was. And I did, and uh, it was quite, quite remarkable. The fact that I remember that um, is even more remarkable. Um, then finally, it was during the 50s that um, uh, as a young kid, I, my parents took a day trip through the Berkshires and coming down the Mohawk Trail. And we went into the backwoods area and I actually saw um, the Yankee Row uh, plant in preparation to being, to being built. Finally, I noticed today that the title of today's forum was looking forward between looking backward. Somebody I think was, uh, uh, took a play on the words of Edward Bellamy's utopian novel, Looking Backward, which had a significant influence on political and planning ideologies at the end of the 19th century. The protagonist in the novel wakes up from a hundred years sleep to view a dram dramatically different Boston um, and how it transformed for the better. Um, kudos to the forum's uh, title selector, well done. Now, a quick comment in terms of the article that Jim talked about. Um, I wrote it with Professor Xenia Coatfall, now at Michigan State University. And it came as a request of the Yankee Electric Company who wanted an unabashed, accurate summary of the economic, social, and cultural impacts on the immediate region from a neutral research organization's perspective. Uh, there was great distrust in terms of uh, being able to, to, to get factual things out there at that time. And then we said we would do it if we had complete access to their local records and that there would be no editorial intervention by the company. They agreed and we agreed. And several years later, we had a scholarly article accepted on the impacts of the closing um, in the Journal of the American Planning Association. Of the more than 120 articles and tech reports that Xenia and I have written, this article has had the longest shelf life and is still being referenced today. We won't go into the findings of that report because it's, it, you, can, you can get it online um, and, that, uh, and, and I think you'd probably get a, a more holistic and comprehensive view than I can give in, in my 10 minutes. The, the key points are this though, that it influenced virtually every community in the region. Um, the closing was indeed profound for, for people connected and people unconnected um, to the power plant. And, and, uh, and indeed, um, it pointed out in, in some deep, to some factual ways, uh, what, what these things were. So now, today, I want to present a series of threads and thoughts that I hope will stimulate conversation and ultimately lead to some courses of action. First, I want to cloak nuclear power as a patriotic activity. No matter how much government tried to separate military and civic nuclear activities, they are linked. Nuclear power to me is part of the national military's industrial complex. It must, see, it must have the same level of attention that the military complexes, the military facilities have. Secondly, as with military bases scattered across the country, they are produced, provided evidence of the nation's collective commitment to making, the, making us safe and secure. The theme we are all in this, I think is critical to establish and maintain. 
Well, as Bellamy noted, since the time the nukes began, our attitude towards them has changed. Um, and that uh, having a nuclear power plant in our backyards is not so much a piece of pride as it is a worrisome activity. As well, there is little evidence of national assistance to assist us in the closing, closing and removal of these plants. And having said this, there is hope that things can change and forums like this are going to help. I want to lay out a couple of my key thoughts that I hope will stimulate conversation today. I'm sure that many of them have already been discussed. And nonetheless, I wanted to package them. First, we need to cloak the removal of these plants as part of the national good. <clears throat> they never were simple business ventures. And for this reason, there should be a collective approach to closing at the federal level, rather than each community going having to go after individual grants through multiple agencies, bundling them together, so that in order for us to make progress on this thing, what we really need is a comprehensive focus point that will enable the communities to come in and say, all right, all aspects related to this are in the same bucket, and let's see what we can do. I think also that the feds need to be the bill payers on this and the organizers of recovery planning. <coughs> Excuse me. The BRAC, in, under the BRAC system and the local development agency approach, um, uh, I see great merit in. There must be a long-term commitment to closing these activity, activities. They will take years and the closing process must include stakeholders beyond the local level. I'm well aware, particularly in New England, of the concept of local persistence when it comes, comes to issues. But I think this is one instance where we need to think regionally and even, even multi-regional um, in terms of closings. The TVA concept from the 1930s has had long staying power. And if you look at that and you look at how many multiple regions were approached here, TVA and the creation of electrification um, in the Mid-South, um, it's regularly hailed as one of the greatest achievements of planning in the United States. And I think we could do this virtually um, in terms of focusing on multiple uh, nuclear power sites, getting the same pots of money, the same resources together um, in order to get satisfaction on everybody's part. Finally, I've had this idea for a long while and I don't know if it'll float or not. And then I think we need to explore the creation of a national bank collectively financed uh, by the energy companies and matched by the public, by the federal government um, in order to make sure there's a pool of money that can go forward in terms of helping communities to, 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 uh, to address these issues. Finally, I mean, fifthly, I would urge the Nuclear Decommissioning Collaborative, perhaps it's partnering with small cities, to sponsor an, a, a national competition to, to illustrate optimal options that could, close, that could occur on these closed sites. Nothing in my career have I realized as much as the importance of a good picture. Nothing in my career says, look, what happens when we close these places and what can we do after? And that indeed that showing these, the options is really going to create a great degree of interest and stimulus that in terms of what can go forward. We need to demonstrate them that the, the, the art of the possible, something can happen and, and, and for the good of the community, uh, keeping in regard its safety as well. Now, I may be dreaming about this, but so did Edward Bellamy. And on this day, we're looking backward, looking forward. Um, we, uh, we, we may want to consider this. We also need to form a congressional caucus of senators and reps to discuss the collective actions that could occur. I have uh, spent a long time in the military. And one of the things I realized uh, was the formation of caucuses can be very, very powerful. And that, um, and indeed I have seen, and I was a national guardsman and a reservist and an active duty officer. And I can see the help that these caucuses have, 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 have stimulated in turn improving conditions and, and getting the results that, 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 that are needed. And I think that, uh, uh, I would urge this organization and uh, to go and, and, and look, look at that as a possibility. Finally, while I have noted the emphasis of today's forum is on decommissioning, I wonder where the place of commissioning would fit in the work of the collaborative. Um, I don't know how many of us are aware, but uh, the, uh, we're now working across the globe on small modular reactors in China, Russia, and England and even in our, uh, our Idaho National Laboratory, um, small mod modular nuclear power plants. 
Okay, now let's say that they become a reality. And I understand that 90, by 1929, some test sites will be, be, be up and working. Imagine if we participated and say, our job with you in creating these smaller nuclear power plants, if, if indeed they're wanted, um, would be to make sure that we don't forget the past. All right, and learn from this and say, what does the community need in order to have these, these things, if they are acceptable um, in our area? And so that to prevent the, what the reasoning for, for all of this, this anger and, and that we've had over the treatment so far. Uh, perhaps it is time collaborative to become involved in such an effort um, and, and make sure that the past is not repeated. Imagine the impact that we could have on this. In any case, unlike Bellamy, it's time for us not to sleep, but to wake up. And I hope these thoughts have helped you today. And I hope we have a great forum. And above all, thank you for having me. Thanks very much, John. Um, I really appreciate the, the thoughts that both you and Marge brought to the table. Um, uh, just a quick point of order, Jerry. Uh, I see a bunch of slides on the screen, but are we doing this now or is it my turn to introduce Brian Borlick? Apologies, Jim. Thanks for pointing that out. We're going to go to Brian Borlick right now so we can take the slides down. All right. Um, so with that, uh, it's now my privilege to introduce Brian Borlick. Uh, Brian is the Director of Performance and National Programs at US EDA. And as Jerry mentioned, EDA is the funder of both this event and our collective work over the past several years. Um, now, my, my accountant might kick me for saying this, but it's not just the funding that matters. Um, it's Brian's belief in our work and the support of his staff that's really kept us going over the years. And for that, we are very grateful. Uh, so again, thank you for your support, Brian. Thank you for your support, EDA. EDA. And uh, take it away, Mr. Borla. Well, thank you, Jim. Really appreciate it. And good morning, everyone. Uh, EDA is very excited to be participating in the first ever Virtual Nuclear Communities Forum to engage and support nuclear host communities across the United States. I want to start by thanking our technical assistance for nuclear communities providers, NATO, Research Foundation, the Center for Creative Land Recycling, Smart Growth America, and the Nuclear Decommissioning Collaborative for organizing this event. Thank you. Uh, these organizations, which EDA is very proud to have partnered with through our Research and National Technical Assistance Program, or RNTA, they're working together to provide capacity and other assistance through the Technical Assistance for Nuclear Communities program. This is a program designed to help communities navigate the decommissioning process, to help them build capacity, and to pursue funding for projects and chart a sustainable economic future. These services provided through the program are offered to any nuclear community in the United States at no cost. The program also includes a community of practice aimed at bringing together nuclear host communities to discuss issues specific to the decommissioning process and to share best practices and insights across impacted communities. If you haven't already done so, we would encourage you to connect with any member of the technical assistance team on these services and to join the community of practice. I'd also like to highlight EDA's continued commitment to supporting nuclear host communities. I'm glad to report that EDA received $16.5 million in grant funding in our fiscal year 2022 budget to support our assistance to nuclear closure communities program. And this funding will soon be available to support communities and regions that are home to nuclear power plants as they build diverse, resilient economies and prepare to respond to the economic and social impacts of past, present, or potential future plant closures. If you have any questions about this funding opportunity, please join EDA later today at the discussion room breakout session called EDA Funding Q&A. Uh, one short, but I think important final note, wherever your community is in this process, it is never too early to plan for economic resilience and diversification. 
Thank you all very much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our technical assistance team. Thank you. All right. Hi, Jim. We can't quite hear you. Please unmute yourself and then we'll get started with the lay of the land. Does this work? Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm the last speaker that's going to wave my arms and stuff. We're going to actually get to people who know it, you know, to, to real on the ground folks after I, after I get out of your way. Um, so I'm going to spend just, I've got a little over 10 minutes to sort of set the lay of the land here. And what I want to do is start with a question, which is, what is successful decommissioning? Well, I, you know, guess what? It depends on who you ask. Um, in, in, from an industry perspective and a, and a regulatory perspective, you know, decommissioning, if it's done right, gives you a couple things. You know, a clean patch of dirt. Uh, next slide. Uh, a terminated NRC license, next slide, and a little bit of nuclear waste surrounded by a chain link fence with some security, um, as well as a welcome sign. Now, now make no bone, wait, hold on a second, we're going too fast here. Can we go back a little bit? Thanks. I mean, make no bones about it. Getting to this point is, is a tremendous undertaking. It takes a lot of effort and work and dedication and skill and perseverance to, to achieve decommissioning from a, you know, a regulatory perspective. And I think the NRC and industry deserves a lot of credit for making, the, making those decommissioning projects a reality. Next slide. The issue, however, is that decommissioning is not this, right? It's not economic development. It's not ribbon cutting. It's not groundbreaking. It's not, it's not job creation. So that's sort of the, the two sides of the coin here. On the one hand, it's a very detailed, very comprehensive technical and regulatory process that achieves very clear outcomes. But at the end of the day, those outcomes don't really resonate a heck of a whole lot with host communities. And all we're trying to do is sort of bridge that gap. A little bit. So let's take a step back and, and, and ask ourselves, how could we envision getting to this place where decommissioning starts to become the ribbon cutting, the economic development engine to help communities plan a resilient future? Next slide. So look, when the plant closes, there's nothing new here. We've already heard about it. The, the golden egg laying goose flies away. The tax base you know, decreases, workers out migrate, Real estate values go down and municipal budgets shrink. One thing that we see across the country, however, is that these impacts are not really fully understood and appreciated until they happen. That's human nature, but that's just the way it is. Um, but and as Marge pointed out, it's not just the economic impacts, it's the social, the, the so social and emotional toll of a plant closure. Uh, this, this dimension is often overlooked, probably a little bit harder to measure and evaluate, but when a plant closes, you know, the host community fabric and identity is, is challenged. If you've worked for, a, or if you lived in a community for 30 or 40 years and all of a sudden a chunk of your high capacity families leave, that's a, that's a, significant, a significant strain on, on, on the host community itself. And so how does a community deal with, with, with a, a plant closure and decommissioning? What kind of, what kind of outcomes are, are available to, or what, what kind of measures are available for you to, to influence outcomes? And the answer is pretty much not much historically anyways. Uh, the decommissioning process itself is a very steep learning curve. Uh, socioeconomic impacts are generally outside of NRC jurisdiction. And meaningful community engagement on a good day is difficult. But if you're trying to rally forces and align interests during times of fiscal and societal stress caused by the closure, it just makes it that much more difficult. But 
you know, so my question right now is, is, you know, are we having fun yet? Um, but but it's, it's not it's not all doom and gloom because our work has has, has highlighted sort of three key levers of opportunity for communities who are in the closure process or who, who will close in the future. And I'm gonna be very brief and, and hit these. Uh, impact analysis and mitigation planning, outreach and coalition building, and potential site use and regional planning. Next slide. Impact analysis and mitigation. Look, it, it's, it's, it's critical to understand and clearly define the plant's role in your community. From an economic and employment perspective, how, it, how the budgets are impacted by the plant operation, how community well-being is defined and, and influenced by the role of a functioning nuclear power plant. Once you have that baseline understanding, and I would suggest respectfully that many communities do not, but then you have to, then you can model the, the eventual closure, not the potential closure, the eventual closure, because all plants close. And so when the plant closes, how does that impact? The, the, the role of, the, of, of a functioning community. What are those gaps? Only then can you explore sort of potential mitigation measures, but you first need to understand the nature of the problem. And you're gonna hear today from the, the really the groundbreaking work that the folks in Vermont have been doing for years and years on this impact analysis and mitigation front. Next slide. Outreach and coalition building is also a critical element here. Uh, the most important rule, idea, theme to understand is you can't do this by yourself. Um, there's strength in numbers. Uh, plant closure is a regional dynamic. There are local, regional, state, and federal stakeholders, all of whom have a role to play, many of whom may not know each other or have been introduced to each other previously. But there's real opportunity here for aligning interests once this stress is understood on, on the region itself. Um, and our general theme is that, look, once the plant closes, everybody wants the same thing. They just may not know how to get there. And so the, the, the outreach and coalition building and, and, and forming the coalition of the willing to help advise, understand, and manage closure impacts and, and, try, and, and mitigate is, is super important. And you're going to hear from Michigan and Illinois today on that. And then finally, uh, you know, regional economic planning and site reuse. Look, it's, it's, it's very clear and understandable that people attention to site reuse happens right away. You know, they, that, that the site's gonna, gonna all of a sudden transition once closure happens and decommissioning is completed to another golden egg laying goose. Um, there are, however, significant regulatory and business risk management challenges, not to mention that that site's not going to produce a nickel of revenue for decades, at least after closure. So the question is, what can you do in the meantime? And regional planning is a parallel effort. It is, it is, it is a, a program of work that's being explored by a number of our host communities, and there's really opportunity for near-term traction in that area. Um, and, and traction because the community has greater control and influence over near-term outcomes. And you're gonna hear a, a, in the third panel today, experiences from California and Illinois on, on, on this as well. So I've, I've hoped I've sort of set the stage. I've hoped I've got us back on schedule. Uh, we're now gonna hear from people who are way smarter than I am on this issue and uh, take it away, Chris and Jen and Jerry, thanks. Thanks, Jim. And thanks again to Marge and John for a great keynote. Uh, as Jim outlined, we're going to hear from communities on three different panels uh, coming up next, and we'll have time for some Q&A. So please do add any questions you might have into the Q&A box, and we'll have plenty of time to hear from them. Uh, our first panel will be moderated by Chris Zimmerman, Vice President for Economic Development at Smart Growth America. Uh, and we'll also be hearing from Jen Stromsden of the Brattleboro Economic Development Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation and Chris Campany of the Wyndham Regional Commission. Jen and Chris, thank you for joining us today. And Chris Zimmerman, please take it away.